There was a little girl, maybe three years old, who entered the church with her mother. And when she caught sight of the the manger, the nativity scene, she ran up to it, she reached into it, she grabbed the baby Jesus, she held it up and said, look, I found God. (laughs) When did you find God? Or to be more theologically accurate, when did God, or when did you realize that God had found you. I think for each of us, there's probably three categories that each of our answers to this question fall into. First, maybe you grew up in a faith-filled home and there was never a time when you did not know God. That's a real blessing and I think that's what we want for, for all of our kids. Second, maybe you can point to a definitive point in your life when for whatever reason, you were found by God You came to know him in a real, personal way and entered into a relationship with him. For some, maybe this is when your faith stopped being your parents and then became your own. For me, this happened in high school. Or third, maybe you feel like you have not found God. And if you're in this third category, I just want to give you an encouragement. If you earnestly seek God, God will find you. If you open up your heart to him and ask for his grace, he will give it. You may not find God where you expect, and God may not come to you as you expect, but I assure you, you will find him and you will be found by him. Because as Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount, seek and you will find. This is the story really of the three magi which we heard in today's gospel. The word magi originally referred to members of the Median or Persian priestly caste who interpreted dreams and advised the king. To the Jewish imagination, however, these pagan magi were associated with being sorcerers and enchanters, the most unlikely folks that you would expect to come pay homage to a Jewish Messiah. But as we see time and again throughout the gospel, Israel's king is welcomed by those you would least expect, while those who should, the Jewish leaders, actively work against him. And if we're being honest, we see the same thing play out time and again today. The people who should be most ready to welcome God and to find him in others are often those who harden their hearts first. And I know for myself, I have played the Pharisee so many times and I begin by praying each day that I'm ready to, to welcome God however he comes to me. When the Magi arrive in Jerusalem, they ask, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his his star at its rising and have come to do him homage. In the ancient world, the appearance of the star was often associated with the birth of a great person or a king. But for us, it matters not whether this was an astronomical phenomenon or something else because what's clear is that God provided a supernatural guide to lead the Magi to Christ. Just as God gives each of us all of the inspirations and all of the helps that we need to find him. But while the Magi are filled with hope and expectation, we read that Herod was greatly troubled and all Jerusalem with him which makes sense because King Herod was not in the hereditary line of King David. His family was actually ethnically non-Jewish and they got themselves to appointed to rule over the Jews by the Romans. Further, in the later years of his life, Herod was violently paranoid at, about potential rivals to his throne. So what does Herod do? He calls together the, the Jewish religious leaders And he asks them about this, and they say that based on the prophecy of Micah, the Messiah would be born in David's own hometown, Bethlehem. 
And so Herod sends the Magi off to Bethlehem and he says to them, go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. It's like you can almost feel the insincerity of his words. Because if he really meant it, Herod would have eagerly went off with them. And for us, that is the difference between knowledge and love. Because without love, no amount of knowledge is going to help you find God. The Magi, however, had love, and so they were undeterred by Herod's pretense. They kept seeking. For us, when we encounter difficulties or shortcomings or detours on our path to finding God, we might want to give up, but we should always remember that it's God who draws faith out of us. So we should always keep going. The Magi followed the star, and the star led them to where they needed to go. And I love this detail. It says the Magi were overjoyed at seeing the star. Friends, whenever we receive an inspiration from God, we should be overjoyed, even if it's just the sting of our conscience when we've fallen into a sin. We should be overjoyed, why? Because when God comes to us in any way, it's an invitation. God never lifts his hand to rebuke, but to forgive and invite. And then once the Magi came to Jerusalem, uh, to, to Bethlehem rather, it says they entered the house and they saw the child with Mary, his mother. When I imagine this scene in my mind, I kind of see darkness outside and a lot of warmth and a lot of light inside. I imagine inside the house with the infant Christ in his mother's arms, there is profound stillness and deep peace. Because when we find God, or rather when God finds us, we experience tranquility and serenity. The conflicts that we might feel in our souls begin to quiet. And even if it is only for a moment, we feel the agreement between faith and reason, hope and attainment, conscience and conduct, and even that sense of agreement between our will and the will of God. And so the Magi give the response of faith. It says they prostrated themselves and did him homage. The Magi recognized that Jesus was Messiah and God. The same Messiah and God that Herod and the other religious leaders either failed or refused to recognize. But the response of faith isn't just a state of mind. Rather, it has to overflow into our actions. And so what do they do? It says they opened their treasures and they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The gifts that they offered were the external signs of the love that was in their heart. Gold for Jesus' kingship, frankincense for Jesus' divinity, and myrrh for Jesus' humanity. In some places around Christmas, there's a custom around Christmas time of going before a major scene kneeling and praying to the baby Jesus and asking him for a gift. So if you were to kneel before the manger scene right now, what gift would you wanna ask from Jesus? Maybe it's something that might help you know him better or move you along your path. And then the flip side of asking Jesus for a gift is giving him one in return. What gift do you think Jesus wants most from you?